to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to our Curious Amalgam. I'm Elise Sorcy, and the title of today's episode is, What is PE Anyway? All the questions you are afraid to ask about private equity. Private equity has been in the hot seat at the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division lately. Both agencies have increasingly expressed skepticism regarding PE buyers and owners and have devoted more resources to investigating matters where PE parties are involved. But what exactly is PE and how does it fit into the antitrust regulatory landscape? In this episode, we'll speak with our guests about all things private equity and ask all the burning questions you might have been afraid to ask. With me today is my co-host, Yana Seidel. Hey, Yana. Hi, Elise. You want to introduce our guest? Yeah, absolutely. We have the pleasure of speaking with Sarahi Constantine Padilla today. She's currently senior counsel at a P- at the PE firm Wahlberg Pincus, and she was previously at Kirkland and Ellis focusing on antitrust and competition matters. Welcome, Sarahi. Hi, thanks for having me. So let's dive right in. Um, let's start with some level setting for those of us who you know, may not have had that much interaction with PE so far. Fundamentally, what does it mean to be a private equity firm? Do, do PE firms tend to specialize in certain ways? Do they focus their investments in particular industries? So I think the biggest thing about PE is there's no one size fits all, right? So every PE firm is different. Some firms focus on a couple of sectors. Some firms maybe have broader sectors. Some firms will focus on a certain type of sort of investment profile for a company. Other firms will focus on different type of investment profiles. So, you know, do you invest in what we would call like a late stage type growth uh, or late stage investment, which is, you know, a company that maybe is further along in the growth process? Are you going to an early stage where maybe it's, you know, a newer company still, you know, operated by the founders? Like, it's all different and it all kind of depends on the situation. So there's no, you know, firms sort of determine what makes the most sense for them. And, you know, that everybody's investment professionals are figuring out what's the best investment to make given where they want to go and the type of work that they want to focus on. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, they can be a little bit all over the map in terms of where their investments might land. Um, how do PE firms tend to be structured? Talk to us kind of about the fund setup. So the fund setup is probably the, uh, what we would call the strategic side of, you know, private equity firms. It's, you know, how do you actually take this money and deploy it um, to make the investments in whatever companies you want to invest in? Um, and I think that also kind of it depends on you know where your investments are coming from, how you want to pool them. Some firms might have sort of different funds for different sectors. Some firms might have different funds for different sort of regions. But generally, what you'll get is a what we call a fund, uh, which is going to be sort of a you know collection of entities, you know corporate sort of formation, depending on wh- where you need it to go and how you're going to use it and who your investors are. Um, but sort of this collection of entities and there's uh, pools of capital, but it's not actually pools of capital that are sort of sitting there waiting to be used. You sort of figure out what investments you want to make. And then all of our investors have made, you know, commitments to the funds where they say, listen, I will commit, you know, a hundred dollars. Let's just make up a number, a hundred dollars to this fund. They don't give us a hundred dollars on day one. They give, uh, you know, $10 on day one to make this investment here. And then we'll come back and say like, you know, next year we actually have a new investment. Um, so we're getting another $10. So then they give us the, the other $10. So it's, it's sort of a more stretched out process. It's not just a pool of money that's sitting somewhere um, in a bank account. <laughs> um, that's just sort of accumulating interest. So, uh, you know, we, whenever we have these investments that we have to make, we'll do what we call sort of a, a capital call and, and you call the capital. So, you know, you invest, you, you committed a hundred, you've only given, you know, 10, your pro rata share of this new investment or this new capital call will be, uh, you know, I don't know, another 10, another 20. Um, and so it depends, obviously you don't, you never want the accounts to get to zero. So there's always some, a little over, so it's never just for a specific investment. 
uh, but you'll you'll sort of just see where it goes in, in the fund cycle, essentially. So earlier on, it's going to be more capital calls. Later on, as you, you know, start maybe selling some of the assets, you're distributing capital. Um, you know, ideally, that's, you know, means you made a great investment. You helped a company really grow. It's really managed to, you know, uh, it, it, uh, give you great returns and you got to distribute that capital to, to investors. So that's that's sort of how the fund itself is structured. And then what the sort of the purpose of each fund depends on how each private equity firm is going to set that up. So you might have a fund that's just for technology. You might have a fund that's, you know, just for uh, healthcare. You might have a fund that's just for U.S. investments. You might have a fund that's just for European investments, sort of. It, it's all up to, you know, the, the private equity firm or the sponsor's um, sort of strategic plan. Yeah, thanks for that super helpful overview. So we talked a little bit about, oh, you, you gave us an overview of kind of the, the fund cycles and how they're all driven, purpose-driven, right? What about timeframes? So is there a general time frame or a time limit that PE firms would typically tend to target for their investments? And when they do look to make their exit, who, who do PE firms tend to sell to? So I think in terms of time frame, it's also a little like a broken record where it's all case specific. I think some firms maybe have shorter time frames. Some firms will have a longer time frame. Um, I, I feel like if you you know went to a business school course and asked a, some academic professor what the time frame is, they'd probably give you something in like the you know maybe three to four to up to maybe seven years for like a, a whole, maybe a little less. Um, but you can obviously hold on to companies longer than that. You can hold on to companies for less time than that. Um, and in terms of what you look for in an exit, it kind of depends on the strategic plan that you know, the firm, the private equity firm will have for the company or the investment. So, you, you know, you make an investment and, you know, you're, you make an investment with the vision, like we want to grow this branch, we want to increase scale and capacity and, and um, you know, e e export to XYZ new jurisdictions, um, sort of whatever those goals are, and then you got to figure out, well, how are you going to do that? Like, you're going to deploy some capital, you've got to make sure that you bring in the right people at management who can sort of really manage the day to day of how to execute on that vision. Um, but, you know, sometimes things come up in the world. So, you know, COVID, for example, obviously was not planned. So a lot of people had to readjust what those, what those plans are, what the sort of end result looks like and what the time frame would be for, you know, what your hold would be and when you would, when you would be looking to exit. Uh, but I think there's also parts of, of private equity where it's just, Maybe somebody just comes to you and says, hey, we know that you you are an investor in this company and we really want to buy that company today. And it you know, was not part of your plan, but sometimes you get an offer and you're like, that offer is really good. So we will take you up on that. Um, sometimes you'll get an offer and be like, you know, I'm not ready to sell right now. Maybe we can partner with you and you can, you know, we'll sell half of it and then we'll, you know, have an exit plan to get out in the future. It's, it's really just going to depend on the situation and, um, you know, how the company's doing and what how it fits into the overall, you know, strategic goal of, of the private equity firm. Great. And I think just kind of to wrap up our background discussion here a little bit, um, what kind of clients do PE firms have? Is that something that differentiates them from potentially other investment options? Uh, I mean, so I guess PE firms have clients who are the, you know, limited partner investors. They're limited partners who are investing their money and, um, I, I think some firms might differentiate more towards, um, you know, maybe pension funds or maybe sovereign wealth funds or sort of different types of, of other sort of maybe more institutional types of, of capital sources. Uh, that's not to say that you can't just also have really wealthy individuals who want to deploy capital. I think it's all just depending on, on sort of the private, private equity firm and who they're really going to be building those relationships with. A lot of it is a relationship basis. And, uh, you know, you build those relationships with people, people trust the type of investments that you do. Um, they trust the type of maybe sectors that you're focused on or what your strategic vision is as a private equity firm. And it aligns with how they want to make their investments. And sometimes it's just, a, you know, as a limited partner investor, you know, you want to be diversified and you want to have different types of, uh, uh, you know, investments within your portfolio. So it really kind of, it's kind of a matching process. Um, and so on both sides, you're looking for a strategic fit. Um, and, you know, can we work together in, in building this relationship? Let's turn to PE and antitrust. So where where does PE fall in the M&A landscape? So in other words, in the antitrust context, 
when might we run into PE firms? So I think most likely, um, and what we've been hearing a lot from, you know, the FTC and, and the DOJ is you run into PE as, uh, you know, a buyer or a seller of companies in the United States or really anywhere in the world. Um, and and it, it's sort of a, a misnomer because a lot of times, you know, a private equity fund might make an initial investment to sort of enter this space. Um, and maybe the plan is to, we, you know, this company is involved in, uh, you know, distribution in the Pacific Northwest. We really think that we can, it's like a great base and we can, you know, expand that and, uh, you know, bring that to, uh, you know, the Midwest or something. And so you would look for something to sort of maybe potentially combine those platforms or organically grow the company to move out into the Midwest. And so if you were going to use that sort of inorganic growth method, you would look for another acquisition. And so in that case, that's not really the private equity firm that would be making that sort of second acquisition, right? It's going to be the company that's operating it because there, we're sort of a level removed. I think the way to think of it is, you know, private equity maybe has a, a broader vision of where they think a company can go. And, uh, you know, there's tons of people on staff uh, that are focused on, you know, value creation, you know, how can we make this process more efficient? How can we support, you know, companies to to expand their scale, to expand their supplier relationships, to diversify customer relationships, sort of thinking through that strategic level. And, uh, you know, sometimes the companies then decide we want to grow by acquisition. And so then the companies will sort of go out and, uh, you know, present that proposal and, uh, you know, sort of go pursue those types of opportunities in addition to sort of everything else that, you know, they're focused on in terms of running the business. So I think you really see it in the the acquisition and the sale of, of companies. Uh, but really, it's it's sort of everywhere in terms of how you um, the type of support and ongoing support that you provide companies, because I think one thing that's probably often forgotten is when you're growing, you know, these small companies that are maybe founder owned into, you know, much larger scaled, you know, national competitors, uh, you, you have to sort of help those companies grow not only on the commercial side, but understand the legal risk and, you know, particularly the antitrust risk of like, how do you do that? You know, it's one thing when you're running a company that's, you know, five customers and they're all in the same neighborhood. And it's another thing when you're running a company that's, you know, operating nationwide and you've got to know what those rules are. So I think one thing that private equity firms are also really focused on is making sure that as you grow and scale, you're, you get the support to grow all different parts. So your, your HR teams are growing appropriately and you have people who can manage, you know, HR at that scale, the legal teams are growing appropriately and you have legal teams that can manage that scale. And I think a big part of that is antitrust because it's, it's something that I think a lot of founders of companies maybe don't think about when they're founding the company, you know, they have all the ideas and um, sort of really getting the, the antitrust uh, background is, is I think really helpful and uh, you know, something that, that you provide to, to support them to make sure that these companies are growing in the way um, that they should be growing. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. You oftentimes, especially in kind of the technology space or even a lot of the modern economy, right, where a lot of things are kind of coming, new businesses are coming through that kind of space. You have these people, like you said, who have these great ideas, can really get things off the ground. But over the life cycle of a company, there may be don't have all of the knowledge that they need to have. And I think, you know, to your point, it can be really helpful to start to bring in specialists, right? Who have more experience and can help guide and successfully build a company. We see that a lot, right? Where like the tech companies, they just grow so fast. And sometimes internally, if they're not, you know, planning ahead or, you know, just aware of it enough, it kind of internally, a lot of issues can crop up, including antitrust issues, of course, but like all sorts of things, like you said. Um, and so I think another important kind of, uh, tool that PE firms have is take privates. Um, can you talk to us about what that looks like a little bit? Sure. I think, uh, when you think of a take private, think of a, a you know, a publicly traded company, uh, that, uh, it could be a private equity firm. It could be, you know, some other private entity that you essentially you're buying all of those shares and you're taking the company private. So it's going from public to being privately held by a private equity firm or, uh, you know, hedge fund or, you know, any other type of asset manager. Um, and so that process, it, it's a little different because, you know, you have a lot of information available when it's a publicly held company, you know, there's all these filings and disclosures. So you get a better sense of, of where it's, 
where it's sort of situated in the market. Um, and, and you would expect that it's probably, you know, a publicly held company might have uh, uh, maybe more of a sense of, of antitrust in, in the first place. And then when you're going to bring it private, uh, you know, you're really thinking about how can we help this company grow in a way that maybe it can't do publicly for, for various reasons. Um, and, and so I think that's in those situations, that's what you're really trying to get at is we have this company. We think there's a lot of potential in this public company. It's, it's not going to really reach that potential as a public company. Let's, you know, take it private, you know, hold it privately. And, and then we, we can you know figure out how to achieve that potential. And then maybe you exit again to make it public again. Maybe you exit to, a you know strategic buyer, so another uh, you know type of company that's a conglomerate or, or multinational that maybe wants to buy it. Maybe you exit to another private equity firm. I think the way you have to think about an exit is really you hold on to an asset for as long as you can help that asset continue to grow. And when you realize that there's somebody else, there's some other owner that can help the company grow um, and and. And, and expand and, and develop and innovate and, and do whatever it needs to do to become a sort of a, a better company and provide better services, then, okay, you go ahead and take it. It's sort of like passing the baton. So I, I don't think there's like this ownership claim of like, oh, well, we're not going to sell it because like we really want to own it for like the sake of owning it. Like you, it, it's sort of how, I guess you would think economics works, right? You, you hold on to it for as long as it makes sense for you to hold on to this company, to keep working with this company, to keep growing the company, to keep innovating. And then the minute you get somewhere and you're like, you know, we've got to go into that space over there. And like, we don't have any expertise in that space. Like we can't, we can't help you get to that space, but these people over here really can, you know, that's your exit opportunity. Yeah. Thanks for explaining the significance of that. I think um, I, I really like the the concept of passing the baton. It really brings it back to the point of optimization and how to really move things along for the better, right? So while we're on the explanation piece of this, there, here's one more for you. Um, roll-ups, right? They've been getting a lot of airtime at the agencies lately. Can you tell us what roll-ups are and why they happen? I mean, roll-ups, I feel like, is just a fancy way of saying making additional acquisitions. Uh, I mean, if, if you sort of take a step back, a roll-up is a company acquiring another company. Um, I, I, I think it's sort of gotten this connotation of like, they're somehow unique to private equity, but any company is rolling up. You're making a different acquisition. You're rolling up two companies into one company, right? Like that's that's sort of definitionally what, what it is. Um, and I think maybe part of the, the concern that the agencies have really expressed is, um, you, you can acquire companies that maybe you're sort of just getting off the ground. And so it's going to be maybe below the threshold. So they just, it's, it's an area where they don't have a lot of insight into like is, is, is probably where the agencies are coming from. Uh, but the roll up itself, you know, you're taking two companies and they're becoming one company. And if there's a, if you meet the HSR thresholds, you know, you make your filing. And if you don't, then there's no filing required. And that's just how it's been laid out in, you know, the statutes. Uh, so I, I don't think in and of itself, a roll up is, uh, is sort of a negative thing. I think it's one tool that of many tools that private equity firms and companies in general can use to expand, to grow, to innovate further, to sort of make whatever product or service that they're providing to the market better. And as we've been alluding to, we've been hearing a lot from the agencies in terms of increased concerns over PE firms in particular. And I think some of that sounds a little bit like, you know, there's this piece you just mentioned, right, where maybe they're not getting as much information as they would like. And I think there's also some question, though, from the agencies as to whether PE firms might have fundamentally different incentives than other types of buyers. So Assistant Attorney General Cantor, for instance, you know, recently said that PE firms might sometimes have incentives to, quote, hollow out or roll up an industry and essentially cash out, um, and that that might be different than, uh, you know, a strategic buyer who's in the same market. And what are your kind of reactions to those concerns from your description so far, right? Like one of the things you've been highlighting is how different PE firms can be. Do you think there's um, something that agencies have been fundamentally missing or reasons we should be thinking about PE firms incentives differently than we have been? Um, I mean, I, I obviously, I don't work at every PE firm, so I, I can't speak for how everyone's going to be operating internally. I guess it's, 
it's not something that really resonates with, you know, what I've seen in, in working in, in PE at, at where, I, where I have worked both sort of at, you know, uh, in-house now and then at a law firm. Um, you know, I, th I think ultimately nobody wants to make bad investments. Um, so I, I think every PE firm is trying to maximize how well they can get a company to operate, to exist in the market, to be able to compete um, whether it's by scale, whether it's by innovating uh, more, uh, sort of whatever method they want to pursue to to try to grow and improve the company, uh, I think private equity is aligned and like let's do that, <laughs> let's let's grow that company. And I, I think sometimes you can actually see the opposite of of sort of what uh, you know the agencies have expressed. I think a lot of times when private equity firms uh, are, are looking at their portfolio and you know trying to figure out how to to grow a lot of the the um, sort of equity intensive like innovation and whether it's creating a new you know cloud based platform or, or or whatever it may be like that's that requires a lot of investment and so it's actually a a, a function of you know taking profits that I guess theoretically could have been distributed and actually just reinvesting that along with additional capital from private equity in order to achieve this better end product, right? So I think right now in a lot of industries, uh, you know, going to cloud-based anything is sort of a, a, a where companies want to go. And you got to figure out how to make maybe more traditional brick and mortar companies into a cloud-based operation. Like how do you take advantage of that? Uh, and a lot of that re actually requires more capital. Uh, it requires more investment. It requires, um, you know, really getting your hands dirty and and figuring out like how do you do that. Um, so it's not real. It's not about taking money out of the company at all. Like I think at the end of the day, you you make those investments into the company because you think down the road when we do have the opportunity to exit, when it's that time to exit and we can't take that company any further, like you will benefit from those investments. Yes, that, I mean I think that's how. Uh, you know, economics again <laughs> would work. Uh, but it, it's not, you know, like a continual process of like, let's, you know, strip this out piece by piece until we get to the end and we're ready to exit. And like, we don't have a company anymore. Like that doesn't, that doesn't really align with anybody's interest. So I, I don't think there's, I, I have not come across any private equity firms. I'll say it that way, that who, whose goal is to, you know, take equity or take assets or take value out of a company and throughout the whole sort of process, because at the end of the day, then you're left holding something that has no value. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, expertise in, in terms of like, you know, applying different techniques or having new technology to potentially bring into a problem that a company is facing and additional capital investments are like some of the benefits that PE investors might offer. So in terms of buying opportunities, we, we haven't quite specifically addressed this yet. They're, they obviously come up in divestiture situations as well, right? And you have particular experience in that. You worked on the United Change Acquisition and Litigation, and there the divestiture buyer was a PE firm, right? And it seems like the court took a very different and much more favorable view of um, the PE buyer there than the DOJ did originally. Can you talk about what you might think was the driving force in the court's analysis as to the PE divestiture buyer and give us your takeaways of that? Yeah. I mean, I think in that case, uh, Judge Nichols sort of highlighted the same alignment of interest that uh, in that case, the, the private equity firm that was buying the, the divested change assets, like their incentive was to make sure that they were getting the right assets to be able to grow that business and continue to compete in the market for that business. Because otherwise you're putting down equity, you're sort of throwing money down the drain. And I think that's the type of analysis that that sort of Judge Nichols followed in, in, in finding that we can't make an assumption about an entire industry um, in you know a specific case. Like taking the facts of that case, interests were aligned. Like, you, you are buying this asset and you have an incentive to make sure that you continue to grow the value of that asset so you can get a return on the investment of your of that asset. It, it didn't sort of economically make sense to buy that asset, spend that money, and then try to destroy that asset so that you have nothing left except for the money that you spent on it. Um, and, and I think that's sort of the analysis that the court picked up on. And um, I think that generally makes a lot of sense for uh for private equity in general, the the whole point is to invest this money so you can grow, and 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 at the end of, of that period, you can uh, uh, 
get a return on that investment. But ultimately, in order to get a return on the investment, you have to continue to grow the value of the company. Makes a lot of sense. And I think we're definitely seeing some interesting dynamics between what the agencies are thinking and, you know, potentially what courts are seeing and thinking, you know, being from a very different perspective, right? They're not specialists, but they have different expertise in different areas. So, Sarahi, you recently moved from, fairly recently now, um, from a law firm to a private equity firm. What are what were some of the biggest surprises you saw kind of moving into PE and seeing what was actually going on on the ground there? Yeah, I mean, I think the, one of the biggest surprises is um, there's this sort of belief that if a company is owned by a private equity fund you know, that private equity firm will have sort of all information and data and access to the company, like possible and, you know, be able to get stuff immediately. And, you know, that's, that's not really the case, right? The, the, the portfolio companies are sort of operating, they have their own management teams, they're, they're sort of out there running the, the business. Um, and, you know, we as a private equity firm will get, you know, very high level, like, here's a annual financial statement type, type information. And then, Beyond that, it's really just a case by case of like how involved the private equity firm is with the portfolio company. And I think I didn't fully appreciate that. I think before I I, I came, I think I just sort of assumed, uh, oh, yeah, like if you own the company, you obviously have access to everything in that company and you can just pull up an email and like, you know, pull up, enter into a database and like have this available. And like, that's not really how things go at all. Uh, that You know, there's the portfolio companies are really, you know, operating their own businesses and, um, you know, how much support and, and, and assistance they get from any private equity firm really depends on, on the specifics of the business, what they're trying to do, um, and, and whether they reach out for support, like whether they need it, you know, some companies are like management team is like, we've got this, don't worry about us. And like, okay, charge ahead, got like, you've got it. Um, and then some management teams are like, mm, this is going into uncharted territory. You know, I've never operated a business in Colombia. How do I do that? And that's when they're like, oh, well, you know, we we in the past maybe have operated a business in Colombia. We can connect you with some people uh, who can help you out with that type thing. So it's it's really, you know, specific to each portfolio company, the, the level of um, the sort of type of relationship that a, a sponsor might have. And I think that was probably the most surprising. So... Uh, th- those are really interesting. Following up on um, the HSR filing one, um, I this may be it's it's very timely because just a few weeks ago, um, as of the time of the recording, the FTC and the antitrust division announced a notice of proposed rulemaking that, like if implemented, would dramatically increase the burden on parties that are required to submit pre-merger notifications. Right? And can, do you have any reactions to that proposal and what you might see coming out of it? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we like sort of everyone else are still trying to digest it and, you know, figure out what that actually means for us. Um, You know, I I think, like you said, it it does seem to increase the burden of what, you know, these HSR filings look like in the first place. Uh, But I think a lot of it will just probably be case specific. Like once we start actually making the filings, we'll actually get a better sense of like what this actually means. Because right now, a lot of it is, you know, sort of theoretical and in the air and in terms of how you interpret this and, you know, what does this actually mean? And, um, you know, to the extent, if you just take some of like the sort of ordinary course documents, for example, like some of that's really just going to depend on, on how the the deal team interacts with the company. Like there, there are some things where I'm like, maybe there would be way more ordinary course documents. And then there are some cases where like, we as a private equity firm find out about an acquisition after it's happened. <laughs> like it's not there. There's a lot of things where it's like not, not necessarily being uh, led or directed right by the private equity firm. So uh, I think it's really going to require us taking a step back and, and really taking a, a, a high level sort of 30,000 foot look at the whole relationship and, and the whole process of, you know, these HSR filings and um, you know, figuring out, what the actual burden will be and like how best to, to address it and, and, and how, how to you know, prepare these filings going forward. That's definitely an interesting development, especially because as you're thinking about, you know, you wouldn't necessarily just make HSR filings, right? You might make filings in different jurisdictions. And this move would really kind of move the U.S. towards one of the more or most onerous um, 
jurisdictions in terms of like what all you have to get together for your notification. So um, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. But thanks for sharing it. Sarahi, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a really interesting discussion and I think super helpful for a lot of folks um, who might not have had this kind of background in PE firms. Um, You could go a long time in antitrust without really having to learn very much about PE. And it's been a hot topic. So I think a lot of us kind of had some, some questions that you've really helped address and given us a lot to think about. And it was always just fun again to get to see you and talk to you. Um, before we let you go, we have a couple of final questions for you to help the audience get to know you a little bit better. And the first is what advice do you have for young lawyers or other young, uh, professionals? Um, I think my biggest piece of advice is when you're really junior, ask a lot of questions. Even if you think it's a stupid question, just ask the question. Um, and try everything. You know, I, I sort of stumbled into antitrust. I, I did not, I did not go to law school thinking I wanted to be an antitrust lawyer. I didn't go to Kirkland thinking I was going to be an antitrust lawyer. It, it was something I sort of stumbled into. Um, and only because, you know, somebody gave a presentation about antitrust and I was like, that oh, seems pretty cool. I'll try something there. Um, and you know, seven, eight, nine, I don't even know how many years later, like here I am still practicing antitrust. Uh, so, you know, just make sure that you really try everything. Cause you never know, even if you try something and you don't like it, you never know how helpful, even knowing the background or like whatever random tidbit, hit tidbits that you might pick up will be. Um, and, and you learn something either way, um, you know, trying one assignment, you know, whether it's in your summer or as a first year or second year, you know, doesn't, it's not a marriage contract. Um, so I think just take advantage of those opportunities. And, um, and as you're going along, like ask a million questions, it's, it's better to ask the question than to just sort of try to guess and wonder. And, you know, five years down the road, you still don't know why this like very basic thing happens because you just assume that was just how it always did. And you didn't realize that there was a choice there. Um, so just ask questions, try a bunch of things, um, and, and don't be afraid to, you know, raise your hand to do that. I like that. Yeah. Being curious really kind of ends up getting you, um, where you belong in the end, right. Kind of, um, in terms of opportunities and interests. And it's very fitting for both the podcast today and, you know, our curious amalgam more generally. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretend that I'm the guy <laughs> I like that. Well, um, with that, we have one more question for you. Tell us something interesting about yourself that we wouldn't necessarily know if we only knew you professionally. So I'll say anybody who I've ever worked with that's seen my office would know this, but I am like a huge soccer fan. Um, So all of my offices, wherever I've worked, have always just had like signed jerseys up and like photos everywhere. Um, But I mean, I'm the type of soccer fan that will wake up at like 3 a.m., as I'm planning to do for like the FIFA women's world cup coming up in the next couple of weeks. Like I have my alarm set to watch all of the matches, whether it's 1am, whether it's 3am, like my day will start at that point. Um, you know, I, I, I will get up early on, you know, a Saturday morning to watch a match out of Europe. Um, so I like, I am a diehard fan and, um, definitely willing to do very crazy things like wake up early. I've like, flown halfway around the world for like a 24 hour period just to go to a game. Like, wow. There, there are, there are very few I think limits, that's great. Like I am, <laughs> I am hardcore. It's like, it's, it's the perfect distraction for me. And like, it's great because there's always soccer going on. I'm like, right now we're in like the three week period of the year where there's really no soccer games. Uh, or like, I think there's like maybe one or two a day or a week at this point. And so the dark period. This is, <laughs> Yeah, this this is this is the dearth time of the year, but we're ramping up and like it's going to be, you know, six games a day and I'm going to have my pick to choose from them. Awesome. Yes. And I can attest to the office decorations. Great. Well, again, thanks so much for joining us, Sarahi. We learned a lot and this was a lot of fun. And thanks everyone for listening. We hope you tune in next week. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section 
The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the antitrust section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.